welcome to the new uh, Piggy Blasted's playlist for uh, our sixth playlist, I think around November 2017. Um, this is the podcast where we talk about new music and we show how little we respect each other, basically. That's, um, that's the way it works. Today, today we have six albums to talk about. Uh, one is uh, a classic and one is uh, one I already am familiar with, but the others are not. So the six albums are Queen of the Stone Age Villains. Daughter, Music from Before the Storm, Liars, TFCF, Ghost Poets, Dark Days and Canapes. The classic is My Bloody Valentine's Loveless, uh, which came out in 90, I'm forgetting the exact year, but uh, in the 90s. And uh, Quasar's Featuring Birds, which is a 99 release, I'm pretty sure. So uh, we'll kick off with a couple of questions uh, I put together for Nermal and Fran. And by the way, are you even on the line? Do you want to say hello, the two of you? I am here. Uh, am I, yeah, are, you, are you talking to me? I was, actually, yes. That was the idea. I think we're going to go off the rails again like we did last time. I got a bad feeling about this from the way you just said that. Um, okay, so first, Nermal. Uh, I'm going to open the floodgates and start with Nermal. Um, what was the most coherent collection of music, as far as you're concerned, out of the, out of the well, the four or five albums, I suppose, we'll start talking with, not, not including Quasi? That is... Um... A uh, very hard question for me to answer Good. Uh, because oh, I wanted to think it's cause sort of like on a previous playlist, we were wondering if um, some of this music would be better visually than it would be or like in conjunction with a visual like a film or, a, you know, a, a spectacle of some kind. And I kind of felt that way about uh, Daughter, uh, music from Before the Storm, which um, which I, you know, I didn't actually look into, but I wonder if it's actually from a film. Um, and it's the soundtrack uh, to a to a PC game, actually. Yeah, was, Fran was saying this last time I remember. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's from a computer game, apparently. Not that I know the game, but <laughs> there we go. Well, I think there might be some coherence there through the visuals. Um, but if I were just to listen to the music, I think I would say that the uh, uh, ghost poet is the most cohesive of them because of uh, how um, it really develops uh, from, uh, it really develops interestingly over time. Let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> Let's just say that. Have you, anything else you want to say? Or? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it does, it is a, a, a well put together album in that respect. It's, it is, it does develop really well. Um, and I think it's, it's very much a genre album. Um, and the genre, I wanted to see what you thought the genre was, actually, both of you. That's interesting. You any other comments. I was thinking about that. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's a hip-hop album, but is it typically okay. a hip-hop album? Um, you fell into my trap. Yeah, well, that was <laughs> exactly what I was thinking about it as well. Because really. um, on, on the Deep Cuts playlist um, that I was talking about last time, I think, I am really got into lately, uh, he, yeah. he reviewed it and he was saying how he disagreed that it was a hip-hop album, even though a lot of people have said it's hip-hop. Um, and I, I think he's right, but um, to me, it's it's a variant of that. I would say it's a trip hop album, like an album from just, the nineties. I was just about to say that, Nick. I was going to say it was a trip hop album. I I beat you to it. <laughs> you actually didn't. No, I said it first. Yeah, so we are recording this, works. so we can kind of uh, prove. We don't have this on record. We can kind of prove we got there first. <laughs> so, go, what else you want to say about it, uh, Fran? I swear, I jumped in there. All right. Well, I've I've got quite a lot to say about this album. Really, um, I'm going to start by saying. That while I do think it's a an absolutely cracking album in a way, and there's a run of eight songs from Trouble and Me to Immigrant Boogie, where kind of music-wise the quality never lets up. But then my feelings towards the album as a whole are a little bit complicated, partly because of the genre thing, but also, um, and I shouldn't really say this if I want to be taken seriously as someone who talks about music. You're not though, so don't worry about it. I just felt like it should be a little <laughs> bit better. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, or at least I feel like I should like it more. And I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean a little bit more. Like All the ingredients for me to love this album are kind of there on the surface. Um, but no matter how much I listened to it, there was something that was stopping me from loving it as much as I think I should. Um, and I think it's down to two things in the end. I think one is that there's, there's no moment on this album that really stands out above, above the rest of the album for me. Like if I compare it to something like The Odyssey, for example, Odyssey's Iceberg, which we did on a previous podcast, um, there's a couple of moments like the start of the second verse in Hold It Back and the chorus in Want To Be that made me realise I was listening to something really exceptional and then that never really happens on this album for me 
And then there's also the lyrics. Um, they're not bad, but I found them quite obscure. Now, obviously, Radio had been one of my favourite bands. I can handle obscure lyrics. But if this is a hip-hop album, hip-hop albums usually rely on the lyrics. And Luckily, me, it's not a hip-hop album. So. Well, even if it's a trip-hop <laughs> album, <laughs> lyrics should be more... And I just didn't connect with them. The only exception, though, is Im- Immigrant Boogie, which I think the lyrics were very clear and I really did connect, which is probably why that's the highlight. But I do think it's a good album and I, I feel like I'm moaning just because I'm on a podcast and I've got to moan a little bit. But and you generally moan I like to moan anyway. So. But, uh, yeah. TV. So, uh, uh, Fran, uh, I'm wondering if it's um, if you're actually uh, uh, not uh, that comfortable with m- non melodic songs. Hmm. Well, I don't think that's the case. Um, I mean, I think I don't think it's the lack of melody. I think it's probably the um, I don't know what it is. Like I say, I think there's just a bit of distance there for some reason. Even though I really enjoy the album and I've listened to it a lot and kind of I've gone out running to this album and stuff because there's a lot. There's a lot about it that I do like, but there's just, I think what it is, is I just didn't connect with it in the way that I have connect with, connected with something like The Odyssey, where the lyrics really get me quite emotionally as well, whereas that never really happened with this. And I think mm. that was what it was missing for me. I, I think I can see where you're going with that. It se- seems to me like it's um, a little bit, uh, it's, it's very cool, and it's a little bit like the tricky, it's a bit like tricky, which is obviously a, a similar genre stuff. Um, but it's it's cool to the point where I, I sometimes wonder if it's if it's that invested in what it's saying or if it's more interested in being stylish. And I, and I say that I qualify that by saying I, I really did enjoy the album overall. But I, I'm just this is kind of nitpicking somewhat. But um, if there was an issue, that was the issue to me. It was it was and also I suppose I, I personally trip hop is one of my favourite genres of music and some of my absolute favourite bands are, are trip hop bands. But um, in a way, it's nice to see a band still going and I still going who's doing that genre because it's, it's out of favour in lots of ways. Same time, um, when, when I hear something like that, it makes me want to go back to those classics, like Poise Head, say, um, and uh, it doesn't stand up well compared to those, which is, I suppose, not really fair to say. But still, it, it, it makes me, it drives me towards those albums which I know are, are fantastic already, and I kind of, as a result, it doesn't shine compared to those. So. It's, it's a little bit unfair for me to say that in a way because I'm, I'm sort of suggesting it's, it's great that it's in that genre but also it's not great in that genre. But, you know, I think it's, it's held back by that somewhat, by the, the extent to which it's trying to mimic something that is far exceeds it. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Then. No, what do you think? I think that's a bit of nostalgia uh, and um, uh, an, an effort to uh, dismiss the incredible ingenuity that is Ghost Poet. <laughs> okay, that is that's, Ghost Poet. I love it. I um, love your tone of phrase. If you um, have anything else to say, I feel like we're lacking what you think about this album so far, Noble, really. I don't think you've actually it. said, told us, apart from that it's coherent. What do you think about this album? Um, I think it's similar, actually. Uh, the the one to to what um, sort of Nick is saying in terms of the cool, um, I I but but I uh, I would I would disagree with Fran since that I, I I keep coming back to this. This is a question that you often ask Fran about uh, which album's a grower, you know, mm. which kind of like. Uh, sat with you the more I listened to this the more I, I got out of it and uh, kept kept turning to and I think the thing that actually kept me coming back was uh, something I'm not often attracted to or or pay attention to which is the um, the voice like the the voice of uh, the I don't say intonations on different sounds and syllables and yeah, I was kind of like interested, you know, how he was using his voice to drag out certain syllables and something sometimes uh, extend them, sometimes cut them off. And so I was kind of finding myself sort of intrigued by that. And, and um, it's not actually what I often p- end up paying attention to. But I think because of the uniqueness of that voice to me, uh, it just really sticks out, really sticks out. And, and did, did either of you hear the previous album by Ghost Poet? No. Which was a uh, Mercury nominee. No, and yes. I think this is part of the thing with me is that I, um, part of the reason maybe I felt how I did is that Ghost Poets always, if this makes sense, been someone that I feel like I really wanted to get into, which is why mm. I chose him, because I've, I've heard the odd song here and there, and I've seen live performances, and I've always thought, I think I'd really like this guy, and then this was a chance to actually 
spend a month with one of his albums and then although what normal saying i think it's still growing on me this album i do think i'm still mm. like i've not stopped listening to it and I, I do get a bit more out of it every time but i've still not got that connection but yeah i've not listened to any of his past stuff and i, I would like to go back and listen to some of it now i mean to me i think uh this album is is a step up from the last one so in a sense when you're talking about growing on you i think over his career i'm hoping he'll grow on me further and i'm hoping the next album will be um, will be another step up. You know, I think he's moving in the right direction and the last album was, was definitely solid and this one is, is better than that. So I think we're, we're in a good place with him, but it's just not, you know, he's not quite got there yet. So, Nirmal, do you, do you agree? Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point. Uh, Immigrant Boogie yeah. uh, was, I don't know, my, I think my favorite song on that album. On Brands this one. too, I think he said, yeah. Yeah, that and so, um, I also enjoyed uh, Dopamine If I Do, mainly because it's just an amazing title. <laughs> um, but also it was a very good song nice so uh, talking about individual songs then uh, I had a question for Fran as well which is what, what would you say is the weakest song uh, overall out of these let's say five albums and not include the Quasar hopefully um, so out of, these, out of these five albums which is the weakest song individually and, and what album did it come from um, I get the feeling I'm going to guess in advance that this isn't going to be a popular answer with, with you Nicholas but um, he's always guessing anyway well, for me mind reading Definitely to. the weakest song would be on the My Bloody Valentine album, Loveless. Um, but saying that, I did have a slightly harder time deciding which song to pick out. There was a few <laughs> I could have picked out. Um, <laughs> I settled on To Hear to hear Knows When, because it pretty much summed up every issue I have with this album. Okay. It's um, repetitive, pretty one-dimensional, and there's just no build in the song at all. It felt really flat. It just ends in the same place as it begins in terms of the pace and the instrumentation and the lyrics i'm gonna get a bit ranty as they are through that throughout the whole album are just indiscernible they're like so low in the mix <laughs> i had to keep checking my headphones or improperly because it sounds like music sounds like you know when you you your headphones are only a third of the way in right and it's just it sounded like that all the way through for me and then i looked the lyrics up and they weren't they weren't worth looking up anyway <laughs> um basically <laughs> that song and the whole album kind of it made me think of the Stone Roses with the fun and the vocals taken out. Okay, wow. <laughs> a similar time frame, maybe. Yeah, I mean, so similar time frame. Of, of that period, Not much yeah. less fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to hand over to Nick now because I know I was he's say, a well, fan yeah, of before, albums, before Nomad jumps in, I'll, I'll just say that to me... When you talk about it not moving and not having... First of all, dynamically, I think it has a lot of intricacy in the sound, but I think that the word I would use is hypnotic. You know, I think, I think a lot of the album... Um, tries to, and it's so in, in, embossed with so many layers, uh, it tries to really sort of, and, and I think the vocals are low in the mix as well, try to create this kind of, um, you might have described it as meditative state, um, which I, I found quite interesting, quite intriguing. I will say the album I felt was kind of dated in some ways. It sounded of its time very much, um, sounded... Like it hadn't aged brilliantly, just in terms of production and stuff. And I say that in the context of really, really liking MBV, the album they made, it must have been about three or four years ago, um, which is not that similar in terms of the, the genre, but uh, sounds fresher and newer. And, and you know, I, I really liked it. I know that's, that's probably not a popular opinion across uh, the, Twitter, the Twitter world, because I know this is a classic, many people believe. Is um, this considered their sort of best album yes is it yeah this isn't the, the oh. um, as far as i understand it this is like the kind of genre defining shoegaze album that kind of set everything up for yeah, that genre i mean so. i think shoegaze just isn't my style my yeah. property it's yeah, uh, yeah. i think it does sound like a genre that doesn't work for you if, I get if you're what talking you're about meditation and, but i mean i could i could buy a meditation cd if if that's what i wanted to do and you I could buy this one really i want to i want to enjoy music so um, <laughs> yeah it didn't <laughs> Didn't do it for me. <laughs> okay, no more. What do you reckon? <laughs> uh, well, the the comparison to Stone Roses is good. I think uh, reminded me a lot of that. Um, but without the fun. Without the fun, probably. Yeah, it's like very earnest, very somber, very very kind of like a wall of sound, you know. And uh, so, wait, <clears> is, is wall of sound a criticism though? Let me just get that clear. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, not really for me. I was just observing that, like you know. Uh, uh, the 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 wall of sound and the almost um, um, the voice that you kind of have to seek out in that wall of sound, you know, some like "come find me, I'm here" sort of, you know, uh, mm. 
uh, calling for the attention of, of a listener a little bit, like someone pay attention to me. Um, <laughs> so I'm so lonely and <laughs> I don't know who I am in this world that's now become a chaos of sound and uh, noise. And, uh, but the same sound again and again and again. We're there all there were some songs that were overly long, I will say that, but yeah, I, I don't know. Chaos of Sound is not something I find problematic myself. I mean, I'm, I see what you're saying, no, more, but not that's not a criticism to me. But here, I, kind of, I kind of liked it, but I, you know, I, um, again, it was sort of, uh, uh, what you're saying in terms of it being dated, maybe it's about like wanting a kind of variety in the, in the sound <laughs> that I was, uh, was missing. And I thought, um, I thought that it didn't, it didn't stick with me after listening, you know, I kind of, I also wonder if you have to be a certain age to really enjoy this too. Like, I wonder if you had to be a teenager to really love it. Really? What, a teenager when it came out? Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. So you're saying, you're basically saying it's immature, aren't you? I'm saying it's, uh, <laughs> I think, it, I, uh, not immature, but I would say it's like really great for someone who is uh, in a <laughs> life where uh, where they can just gaze at their shoes and wander around in a field <laughs> or, 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 or in a state of mind that just needs um, like to externalize the chaos right okay that's that's a good save there yeah I thought you were just saying it's yeah. immature which I think would be unfair I think I like it being described as immature I think that fits for me <laughs> I mean <laughs> I, I just think it's it just yeah I, I i really respect the tonal intricacy of it and i think that's really what what draws me to it still although again the new one is is a better piece frankly but on the point of it being immature though it actually chimes in with something else i thought about it is that it i felt like i was listening to a bunch of demos mm. of someone like the stone roses that's or... amazing because i don't know if you know the history of this album if i remember correctly this is the album that like they spent years and years layering and putting on and then just went back to the tapes that they found in the garage because <laughs> that's what it is it really yeah that really surprised if me if I remember the story correctly like demos, it felt like they hadn't finished it right if I remember correctly the story was that it, it, you know, it kind of broke the label that they, when they tried to record this album. maybe I'm thinking maybe I'm mistaken but I think yeah. that's the case they wasted a lot of time yeah 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 okay so um, so let's talk about let me see now let's talk about Queens of the Stone Age next uh, and Nermal you should go in first I guess what, what do you think about Queens of the Stone Age album Yes. Are you a fan of this band, first of all? I love this band. Okay. I, I love this band, and I um, I could listen to this album over and mm -hmm. over and over again and not learn a thing. And <laughs> what? what does that mean? Does wow, that that's mean? so cryptic. It's I like, like it. It's interesting, but wow, what like are you a, talking about? It's like eating a lot for me, you know, for someone like me who really kind of like uh, – spent a lot of my adolescence in metal i feel like this is a bunch of snickers bars that i can just eat <laughs> over and over again until uh, you throw up empty calories now i can throw up but the, it's just like empty calories just constant i have like, no idea what you're saying <laughs> right now it's a great analogy <laughs> this a good yeah, thing? yeah an empty one. A bad thing like, saying, i like snickers I, I, think, I don't like eating loads of them <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. I just like if you instead of you you like you go you have a dinner and then instead of like uh, having a well balanced meal of some like you know protein, <laughs> what, and, you know, what, what you end up doing is eating a dozen donuts and you're like I feel horrible, but every time I'm eating one, it feels fantastic. I think we should all <laughs> mention that Nirmal also has a food podcast. Um, <laughs> he's got mixed up. He's very tired. No, I, I actually, yeah. I actually think this is starting to make sense. I've got to say, Nermal's uh, I enjoy protracted I enjoy analogy it. is actually starting to make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting at is that um, it, it's um, it's too uh, it's very digestible, and yeah. yet uh, you know that somehow it's not actually uh, a very profound, uh, healthy in that respect, meaningful experience. Is that fair to say? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Nailed it. Well done. I just decoded normal. That's a major well achievement. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately then, if, if that's the case, did you, did you not enjoy it? Or did you, you know, would you say you would, you'd go back to it? Oh yeah. I'd, I'd go back to it. In fact, I've gone back to it a bunch of times and then felt 
you know, not good about myself every time I've gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because Have I you listen- just been eating Snickers? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> while, every- while listening to it. Yeah, you know, I listen to the songs and I'm like, that's this is really fun and really interesting and, and like kind of uh, like I love it, you know, fortress, you know, I'm a fortress, I can be your fortress, yeah, you know, it's it's really like he's so sweet and so kind, and then I and then after a while I'm like, that was pretty like banal actually. <laughs> it wasn't actually as profound as I. Yeah. enjoyed it you know at the time and i, I get this sometimes with albums i'm not, I'm not referring to this one now but i get this sometimes with albums when i actually like the album immediately i, I like yeah. if i like it immediately i often worry that that's not going to last that long and it just means it's a very sort of <laughs> care, careless thing which doesn't actually go any depth to it so I, I that's i think i see that as well so yeah we're on the that's same all... wavelength here normally in that respect there although I, i'll jump in and say that um i i really did not like this album at all um oh, really? and i didn't like it because and I, and I have liked albums of theirs before, but I just felt like this was so tired. I just felt like I've heard this over and over again. How how many times can they rehash No One Knows, basically? I mean, that, that's, to me, the problem. And, and the album is fundamentally... Um, they have they have a style. They have, they perfected a really interesting trick. It was interesting maybe 10 years ago. A kind of what I describe as like an on-off staccato style, where they're just constantly hitting a, a chord and then stopping, hitting a chord and then stopping, not ringing it out. And you know, you hear that all the way through all their albums, and that's the problem. Is now I've heard it enough. I really have heard it enough. This this album didn't grab me. I just felt like it was why not go back to the old album. The old album hasn't hasn't been you know erased from history. Just go back to that and, and listen to one of the one of the previous ones and not this one. So I was I was pretty down. It was probably. Um, yeah. It's probably the weakest yeah. album, eh, possibly the weakest album of, of the five, the main five. Right. So, Fran, what do you reckon? Well, as someone who's not really overly familiar familiar with their back catalogue, um, the first question I want to ask you two, who are obviously both fans, is have they always been a glorified David Bowie tribute band? <laughs> Has that always been the case? I think that's insulting case? to David Bowie. <laughs> I mean, really? I can't yeah. think of any album I've ever, ever heard that sounds more like it's trying to be Diamond Dogs. Um, wow. And I, wish ha- I, I wish I knew David Bowie a little bit more to answer that. But, well, you know. I mean, his on this album, he sounds like he's his lyrics are like Bowie's. His, his voice is like he's imitating Bowie. Um, yeah. Perhaps the most striking example is the song Unreborn Again, which is just, I think, I feel like Bowie must have written it for him, it's, except Bowie's lyrics would be better. But um, <laughs> But now, on the other hand, I do, obviously, I love Bowie, so... Um, I got a bit of enjoyment out of listening to this album. I was going to say, that's hardly a criticism, listen. is it, in a way? If yeah, it's but... like one of your favourite artists. But when I've compared other artists on this podcast to Barry, like Hooray for the Riff Rap and Christine and the Queens, that's been because of like their creativity and the invention, the stories told in their albums, whereas here, it just feels like a direct rip-off, which isn't in the same league as the original. Mm. But then... I'm going to dial it back a bit and say it is an enjoyable album. And wow, that's times, dialing it back a lot. Not just a lot times. <laughs> no, uh, this is exactly so. You know, it's like it's exactly like a like a dinner of Snickers. It's exactly <laughs> it's like a dinner of it. Snickers. Yeah, he's not giving up on this one. I mean, it's enjoyable in that you know there's songs that if you're if you've got them on in the background. And I think all three of us are saying something similar here. Bob and Nick's actually two of us are saying something similar. <laughs> Nick's just saying it's horrible. Um, the songs that are okay to listen to in the background, but if you really dig deep into them, it's kind of, it's not original and it's ripping off things that have been better that have come before for me. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, if, as you're not familiar, I strongly recommend you go back to Songs for the Deaf or uh, any, any any of the early I like No One Knows. Three, you know, okay? so, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's, that's the only song. That's, you know, for better or worse, that's, an, that's a fantastic song and they've done a few, you know, close to as good as that, but they haven't done albums and albums worth of stuff that consist, that that good just because they ran out of ideas i think and that's that's really unfortunate but that's the reality you know so for me anyway so has anyone heard the barry comparison before i mean i read it i've never heard that before i read no. an article while i was um i think pitchfork or while, while i was writing up my notes and they were saying the same thing like he throughout the album he gets more and more like barry as it goes on until he just sounds like he's basically turned into him or he's trying to take wow. over the space he left wow maybe, maybe it's an homage maybe but it's not acceptable. <laughs> unacceptable. That's the overall, that's the overarching word, one word review for the Queen's of Sanjay album, unacceptable. Fair enough. So, uh, okay, what have we talked about like then? It. Let's, 
Yeah, but you I, like I, it. <laughs> That's so consistent, stuff. Fran. Yeah, that really makes sense to me. Yeah. So, one, one, what's the guy's name? Do you remember? Do you know the lead? Josh lead Hom. Player? Josh Hummy. Okay, so I might be biased too because he was on a, an NPR show called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which is like a, like a comedy show. Oh yeah. And uh, he was just the most like affable. Yeah. Uh, uh, Friendly. He is also actually quite witty. I saw him on a skit he did with Sarah Silverman yeah. once. It was actually really good about so, about the band, you know. But yeah, I, I'm a bit influenced by uh, bias towards uh, like just wanting to like him too. Yeah, no, so. I, I wanted to like this album, and I, and I do think he seems like a you know perfectly nice guy and a certainly a good musician. But uh, they need to push harder to do something fresh. That's the problem for me. So. Yeah. So okay, we got a couple left uh, on the main list. Um, let's talk about daughter a little more because uh, we only just touched on it briefly, no more. So why don't you give us some more thoughts on that one, Nemo? What was I listening to? Uh, <laughs> you were listening to daughter's music from before the storm. Just to be clear, I want to know what the storm was like. Uh, if this was before the storm, this is so confusing to me. Um, I um, was. Uh, immersed in these soundscapes of um, otherworldly kind of areas. It kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, the planets. Uh, Planetarium. Planetarium. We did last month, yeah. Time, yeah. Don't start talking about planets again. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but did you... Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's been vetoed. Wow. <laughs> I was gonna, I'm just about to go down there again. So. <laughs> but this is, this is really... Uh, confusing to me um and i mean confusing confusing in a good way i mean is it something that you found in, intriguing engaging in that respect or just lost uh, well if i was lost and never found um <laughs> uh, that might be okay you know that might be okay it was just so weird and um and I and I wanted to. I don't. I don't think I quite followed the narrative of what happened to this poor soul that was trapped and uh, hidden away. You know? Did, did you guys? Did either of you understand the, the what happened to this person? Uh, I can't really speak to that. I don't think. I mean, no, I, I I felt like there was a real narrative here. I'm going to actually. I'll just go yes. ahead and talk about this one because I think completely opposite in a way to you, Nirmal, is like the first question that Nick asked about, which is the most coherent set of songs. I think this one is the most coherent set, hands down. Really? Because I feel like it flows really well and it tells a story. And yeah, okay, I'm not 100% clear on exactly what's happening to this person, but I feel like there's a development and I'm following someone through it. And I think it's a, a very coherent album. Um, and also, as well as being coherent, I just thought it was a really beautiful piece of work as well. Um, mm -hmm. I've been a fan of Daughter since the debut, but I think this took them to another level in a way. Like. Elena Tonner is the lead singer and her voice is incredible but I, I love the way on some of these songs it sort of became an instrument like there wasn't lyrics but they were using her voice to drive the songs forward still I thought that was really really well done like songs like Flaws and Departure um, and it's kind of hard for me to pick a highlight from this album because I think if you took any of the songs out it would really suffer but then there's a few Hole in the Earth The Right Way Around Flaws, Departures they all stand out um, and what really surprised me was when I first listened to this album given the fact that I love their previous two albums. I was a bit disappointed to hear so many songs that were kind of instrumental. Um, but then they became some of my favourites. I just think it's a really pe beautiful piece of work all the way through. Wow, high praise. Um, What's interesting about that it's, to me is when you, you mentioned the song Flaws, um, I thought Flaws was way too grandiose, and there were a few tracks that felt like that. And, and actually, that's the criticism that you levelled at Perfume Genius's last album. I felt like this album was too... Uh, just over the top at times. I, I think particularly in a production standpoint, it was re too reverby, too, too much reverb on some of the songs in an attempt to sound flasher and sort of more, um, more pretentious is overstaying it, but more, uh, yeah, grandiose than, than it maybe it was, than was worth it. I, I didn't hate it, but I, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't know that I, it really uh, intrigued me that much. And the fact that it was computer game music, which I actually had forgotten until we just reminded ourselves just now while I was listening to it, I'd forgotten that does seem to make sense to me because you have to have some atmospheric stuff mm. uh, in the background but not really have an album that actually leaps out of you and sort of itself sort of grabs you by the throat you know so um i, I don't think it does do that but maybe that's not really a, a, a massive criticism you know what do you think no more 
you have a terribly violent relationship to uh, music if you want something to grab your throat, Nick. I know. This is why I'm, I'm still searching for that doom metal album we talked about it with Paul Bear last month. Stop I'm still looking man. for that doom metal album that will really grab me by the throat. Stop yeah. searching. Well, I'm not going to stop searching. Trust me, that's going to happen. That's on this plate as soon as I find it. So, so yeah, no, what do you think? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I don't know what... Um, the, the narrative was... Uh, so much like a choose your own adventure kind of narrative like you had to figure mm. out what it was and i thought for that reason it was a little frustrating to me to listen to it without having some kind of visual attached to it so uh the the, the instrumental piece and i think i would maybe look into some of their older stuff because the, the instrumental pieces are the ones that get me lost and and um kind of leave me floating in some, somewhere where where it's sort of uh, where I don't necessarily want to be um, whereas the, the ones with the singing and beautiful, beautiful voice um, made me want to learn more about the narrative and, and, and dig into it a little bit more well I think so like, maybe you have to buy the game no more yeah that's your well, homework we're not, <laughs> we're not that kind of podcast and probably the know. game system as well to play it on I would assume so it's, it's going to be an expensive, expensive review for you it's a PC game oh okay that's um, fair but enough, I do want to yeah I put, I put as my first bullet point actually that I noticed a fair amount of snobbery from you both when I mentioned that it was a soundtrack to a computer game uh, at the end of the last episode so I just wanted to give you both a bit of a bollocking for that as well, <laughs> just, you know. thanks very much I mean I, I'm not slaying it I'm just saying that that itself doesn't really promote an album that it stands on its own I don't think that but idea, I mean, definitely for me, definitely stands on its own. I mean, I think the whole cinematic thing. And I know what you're saying about it being grandiose, but I don't think it's grandiose in the same way that Perfume Genius was. I mean, that felt like that felt like a soundtrack to, but to a bad musical. This feels like a soundtrack because it is a soundtrack. So wrong. And so it, wrong. It kind of works in a in a really beautiful way. But um, this album might sound amazing on vinyl too. Yeah. I'll, tell you I'll never know I'll tell I'm you never going to buy on vinyl <laughs> I'll so tell you Brent, shortly Brent, go back to this album like would you listen to it in its entirety at some 100%, point percent yeah definitely you're just lying you're a liar no I'm not <laughs> I, I love this album I thought it was brilliant I, 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 I installed a, a polygraph on this call <laughs> <laughs> noticed you're lying I think okay. that you both need to spend a little bit more time with it it is a coherent album I would listen to it again and again um, as with the two previous albums, and I actually I love both the previous albums, and I think this might be better. So okay. yeah, I definitely will hear it again. There's okay, no so he's that. right. Well, we'll I'll come back to whether or not it's your favorite album of the set, but um, sounds like it might well be. So we have one left to talk about, which is the Liars album. Uh, Fran, why don't you jump into that first? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, first so, of all, do, do you know Liars? And this is an important question for this. I think I knew Liars' previous important... album previous to this because they were playing at Green Man Festival Mess. this year. So I had a the one called Mess. Yeah. Is that the one where he's got like dreadlocks? Colored, yeah, they're all yeah, on their multicolored. Head, on yeah, cover, yeah. yeah, it's um, amazing cover actually. So, as we've just talked about, what I think is a really coherent album. This was this was a really incoherent album um, for me, bordering on being a mess. But I don't necessarily <laughs> think that's the worst thing in the world. I don't think they want to be coherent. Um, and I think there's some decent stuff on here. There's a track called "No Help" pamphlet, and uh, my favorite would be "No Tree, No Branch," which is a really messy, chaotic song, but it really works. But my overall feeling for this album, and I listened to it you know, at least 10 times, is that for a band who are meant to be so groundbreaking and creative, I was just kind of bored. Um, it never really... It meanders a little bit, and especially if you compare it to the previous album, um, which was a really heavy dance album. Um, so I found it a bit of a damp squib, really. But um, I also thought, because I do know a little bit about Liars, that I'd be really frustrated if I was a Liars fan, because they do change so much and this is so different to the previous album but I'd be really disappointed coming to this from the last one being, um, being a Lies fan and I think I would count myself as a Lies fan uh, is a constantly frustrating exercise I, yeah, I think you're imagine. absolutely right that you, you've nailed it um, yeah I mean uh, to me um, so I followed them since the first album uh, the first album I thought was absolutely fantastic it's called They Threw Us All in a Trench and Stuck a Monument on Top um, <laughs> and uh, which is an amazing title and they have uh Many great tracks on it. They use a lot of really great percussive stuff. It's very energetic. It's very fresh. It's, it's kind of angry, but um, also funny. Um, I'm not reviewing that album, though. No, I'm, I'm reviewing this one. And this one, um, I think Fran really 
can't agree more about the mess idea. I mean, it you know, it's, it's really um, unfortunate that they've they, they love to to sort of throw people for a, for a loop and and do something weird. And they they've done an album, they did an album about Wiccan, they did a whole album about Wiccan a few years ago, which was really bizarre. So it's very very hard to be a consistent fan of this band all the way through, um, unless your tastes are, are just so broad that you're willing to accept almost anything. Um, this album is is unfortunately crosses into incoherent uh, crosses into very inconsistent and there's only a couple of songs i really loved on it um i really liked staring at zero i thought that was probably the best song on the album um had a sort of dark moody kind of vibe to it which i I was really into but as a general rule it was it was really all over the place and also interestingly i think when when you put the songs in a very bare context not like in mess the previous album which was which is so produced and so dancey um his vocals actually sound really weak um, mm. And I, you know he's he's not there to be you know he's not there to be some kind of incredible incredible uh, or you know vocalist. But uh, this really did stand out when you when you put him bare with just a guitar, um, which is you know kind of poorly recorded kind of uh, knackered out guitar. It sounded like um, he, he just sounds sounds like he's off. You know he's off his game really. So so uh, I was pretty pretty disappointed. Um, and uh yeah so i mean the, the worst song was probably no tree no branch i think <laughs> I just that as my favorite uh, song oh did you right <laughs> <laughs> uh but but that was the one where the vocals were weakest but uh in my opinion but staring at zero is my favorite but you know overall there's really no if that staring at zero is a single then we're good but other than that i, I won't go back to it but uh no what do you think you, I'm, I'm assuming neither of you liked the the track face to face with my face I like the title. <laughs> I like the title as well. The t- they got some amazing the titles. titles. Bands. <laughs> I I thought that was a great title, but also yep. good song. I just <laughs> like the track. Yeah. Um, I um, I love the liars. Like the the the. I think one of my favorite all time songs is um, uh, this song called "The Flood," um, and um, the. Uh, weirdness of them, I think, is what I really am attracted to. Um, oh, there's no question about that. They are one of the weirdest <laughs> bands out there, and they managed to keep that up for over a decade. It's unbelievable. I think I think I really I really do like that. I I will say though, I, for this one, I had to a couple of the other albums, especially the that first one you mentioned, Nick, is uh, is one that puts me in a particular mood uh, to you know really sort of enjoy it. But this one. Uh, I couldn't. I had to be in a particular mood to listen to it and, and enjoy it. Otherwise, I felt sort of uh, uh, impatient, and I thought it was kind of interesting, at least just sort yeah. of witnessing my own self being really uh, impatient with with this, the music. Um, but I couldn't find a I couldn't find a through line, you know, in it that that helped me uh, go from song to song. So. You know, I have to say it's mixed, but uh, you know, you know, it's, if I was to look at the whole playlist, um, it stood out as the most sort of chaotic of them, um, and also the weakest. Then, as an album, I sort of want to get to that question anyway. So, what, what, what do you feel that's the weakest of the five? Um, I mean, I think "Daughter" has got to be for me the weakest because I, I just doesn't. I don't see how it's just for the record. Fran is shaking his head vigorously. I don't see how it stands alone. Like you I need just... to spend more time with this album, then. Well, I, I'm I'm in shock that you could say that's the weakest of those five. It's the strongest <laughs> by quite a way. <laughs> I just don't. I don't. I, yeah, you're wrong. So, Fra- <laughs> Frank, what was your weakest then? Uh, my bloody Valentine, hmm. um, followed by Liars, um, but my bloody Valentine um, by quite a way. Okay, I'd say Queens of Stone Age because. The Liars album at least did something I wasn't expecting again, which have done that six to five or six times. I that's how many albums they've got. I think uh, was the Queen of Stone Age. I could I could have you know I could have drawn a diagram. I think it was exactly just to represent exactly what this album would be like. It on just off, have been a picture of David Bowie. Yeah, absolutely. If I could draw that well, yeah, uh, it was you know just the on off the the steady pace, the you know kind of love songs dressed in kind of slightly macho t- vocals. I, it's just not it didn't work for me at all. So. 
Okay, so I think favorites. that we haven't, covers we're it. We're talking about words. Okay, we can talk about favorites. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, what's, what's I mean, your I think it's quite obvious what mine is. I think, I'm not even going to ask you yours. It's, it's, yeah, you're going to buy the vinyl, aren't you? We'll, so that's we'll, always the acid we'll test for the two of us. I'll point out, I did really like the Ghost Poet as well, and I do think that I will like that more as time goes on. Right. But Daughter was the standout for me, yeah. I'll say before No More jumps in that um, I found this list generally mm. underwhelming. Um, there's nothing I absolutely love on this list like I have in some other ones we've done before. The Ghost Poet is probably my favourite, um, and that's often, uh, honestly, largely because um, the genre is one that I'm so into in general that it was hard to resist, you know. But uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not wowed by anything on this list. So go for Ghost, it, Nemo. Ghost Poet all the way, far and above the best. Number one. A-OK. A-OK. <laughs> Ghost Poet. All the way. Okay. Dogs bollocks. And definitely not Donner. And <laughs> don't don't understand where Fran is coming from. And I think um, we should probably have a debrief. Some taste. A debrief, yeah. Okay, debrief fair enough. About whether we want to continue this. <laughs> Sad times for you guys. I'm sorry. All right. I am going to stop you from ranting each other and talk about uh, why I love quasars featuring birds. Um, and, you know, first question is, is it quasar or quasi or, or something else? I don't know. I'm going to go with quasar throughout because that's, that's the way I, I tend to say it. I've been into this band for, uh, God, more than 15 years. Uh, and this is one of their fairly early albums. I think it's either second or third um, and I want to just basically, my comments are basically split up into a couple of things about them, a couple of things about my experience of them, and then a couple of things about what I think of why I love this album musically. Um, I did, well, I did want to say though that beyond this album, there's some other great stuff uh, on other on other albums which are worth checking out. Um, but I wanted to make sure I had a kind of, I wanted to kind of turn it back from the lot, the sort of quite complicated playlist ideas we've been using lately to, to a single single album to see if, how we could sort of talk about the coherence of that piece, you know. Um, so this is a very early example of what became very in vogue to do a two-piece band. Um, and the two-piece uh, model, uh, which, you know, obviously the White Stripes ended up becoming the most famous example of, was, was already um, kind of developed in some ways. I mean, not alone by them, but by, by Quasi. Um, Quasi are basically uh, a keyboard player who also plays guitar in some cases, uh, called Sam Coombs, and uh, a, a drummer called Janet Wise. Um, the band are, uh, have a couple of brushes with, with bigger uh, audiences because Janet is also the drummer in Slater Keeney, um, which is a, 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 you know, a fantastic early, uh, one of the seminal right girl bands who you know, stand alone on their own and, and absolutely brilliant work. Uh, so that's a much bigger project for her. This is a sort of side project. Uh, and she and Sam Coombs used to be the backing band for Elliot Smith, um, before uh, Elliot died in uh, the early 2000s. Um, and in fact, they would go on tour with Elliot, play the support slot as themselves, as, as Quasar, I should say, and then all come in again to play with, with Elliot uh, after that. I went to see them a couple of times on that basis, but it wasn't actually my first experience. Um, my first experience was uh, actually to see them in London supporting Sebado. Uh, I've already talked about Sebado on a previous podcast, and you know I was already thrilled to see them again i've seen them many times but this is honestly the the best support band i ever came across i, I feel like you sit through ten thousand terrible support bands for the opportunity to come across something like this a one-off just to just to walk in the door and find something that you had no idea about and no, never heard of before uh and then it just kind of leaps out of you um I also saw them at, at reading uh in 99 uh reading festival in 99 uh, and they had an, an amazing experience at that, that show as well, largely because uh, they had a lot of technical problems in the show. They were only on for in a sort of fairly obscure early day slot. Um, they only had a small amount of time, and they had a lot of technical problems. And Sam uh, was really kind of clearly sort of downhearted about it and seemed disappointed that he'd come all this way and wasn't able to, to sort of perform in the normal way. And the audience really seemed so enthusiastic about this band that they really lifted their spirits. And, and he... Uh, along with Janet, who was also trying to sort of coax him back into playing energetically. He was still going through the motions, as it were, but he wasn't really sort of as, as energetic as he often is when performing. Um, and, and it ended up being one of those rare experiences where you felt like the band had actually... The, sorry, the audience had actually made a difference to the quality of the show, and, and they really had made a significant one. It looked like he was at some point he was going to get up and leave. So 
um, the, the gig was was one that's, that will always stay with me for that reason. Um, so yeah, they're, 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 I have these kind of personal connections. That the reasons I, I love them musically, though, is obviously the the really crucial thing is um, they they're a mix of two things. They're sort of two things slammed together, which uh, I think are, are very unusual and hard to do. Which is to sound uh, very furious uh, in terms of the overdrive on the organ that they use for a lot of the a lot of the stuff. Very kind of broken and muddled and aggressive in, in the tone of the instrument and then also very childlike um, a lot of their melodies are, are very kind of um, basic in some ways I mean he's, he's, he's a good keyboard player but it's, that's not the way he writes some of these melodies he writes them in a very kind of elemental way um, elementary way I should say um, so that mix is, is really intriguing to me always was that the idea that he would he would you know do something that sounded like a very approachable but is also very aggressive and fast at the same time He's also, uh, in my opinion, a fantastically cynical lyricist. Um, a lot of these songs on this album in particular, and this is probably their most consistent album, um, are just really um, sort of bring you down in a way, but are so funny at the same time that they actually, uh, you know, you can't help but have a sort of wry smile on your face as you're feeling brought down by, by what he's trying to get at. So, uh, so that really works for me as well. I think he's, he's, a, he's a great lyricist. Um, and um, there's a song, there's one song I wanted to mention, which is not on this album, which I really recommend people go to, which is from the previous album, R&B Transmogrification. Uh, and it's the title track of that album. It has this amazing, uh, and this is one of the, this is the first song I ever saw them play. And unfortunately, it couldn't, couldn't be on this album. And I just wanted to put one album in. Um, the first song I ever saw them play was, was this one. And it was basically, um, they play a section of the song and then they stop and rest the song for a few seconds. And they come back in again very fast. And they keep breaking the song, as it were, in the middle all the way through. And, it, and the stopping and starting is something they almost chase each other. So they, they almost, as they're playing it live, you're watching them and they're, they're trying to sort of catch each other out with it in a, in a sort of game, like a game of, of, of tag or something, you know? So that was a really kind of hilarious and, and fun experience to see them do that. And that's the tone that definitely from the first song, Our Happiness is Guaranteed, this album has... Um, and uh, all the way to the end, which they also are very good at ending albums. I think they have a very beautiful last song, um, which is, uh, from, I'm trying to remember the title now, is uh, Only Success Can Fail Me Now. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't want to ramble on any longer, but I, I just think this band is, is very underrated uh, or very obscure by some people's standards and, and really deserves a lot more uh, acclaim than they have. So but I'd love to hear what the two of you think. Maybe Nermal first. Uh, so, Nick, I know you introduced me to Quasi um, several years ago, and it's, it took me a while to to get into them. But I, uh, I think the thing what you were talking about in terms of the humor, the dark, self defeating Elliot's Elliot Smith kind of humor, um, it is a little bit, yeah, yeah, got me uh, hooked hooked immediately. And uh, I, you know. This the the one song off of this album that I always that really has been with me for a, a long time now is I never want to see you again. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, of the way he sings it and the melody of it, it's so joyous and that's like, the childlike quality I was getting at. I think in some respects, yeah, fantastic. I love it. I love it. Uh, it also and, makes you think of me, I guess. I'm sure. Makes it, it, you know who it also makes me think of is uh, Morrissey, oh, yeah. and and the dark, uh, sort of almost brutal sort of lyrics on and and uh, sort of overlaid with something else, kind of more palatable. Um, and uh, and so like I uh, yeah I love I love the stuff and California always reminds me of California. So yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, it's a very Californian tone across the album, I feel like, although maybe I'm, I'm speaking West without knowing enough of that tone, but it's got a sort of Beach Boys feel in some ways, hasn't it? Yeah, hot, you know, kind of sun-drenched uh, sound. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and, and Fran, what do you reckon? Okay, well, um, I'm going to be honest here, and I, I'll de- I debated for a while how honest to be, because obviously you've just done a really good introduction to this band, and... Mm. Actually, some of what Nermal's just said about it taking a long time to get into for him is interesting to me because so far I haven't really connected with them. Okay. And I'm not going to say they're a bad band in any way. I'm not going to lay into them because I like some of what they're doing, but there hasn't yet been that... There's no connection. That connection for me. There's a song, Tomorrow You'll Hide, which I enjoyed the most, but then I think that probably sounds 
the most different to the rest of the album, if you know what I mean. It stood mm. out to me as quite different. Um, but it, it got me thinking this, and not to change the subject completely away from from Quasi, but I'm, I'm, it got me thinking about, um, like me and you, Nick, we probably met and bonded over music, talked about music a lot. We go to a lot of gigs together. Yep. There's bands that we both absolutely love and talk about a lot. And then there seems to be every now and then these bands that just pop up that yeah. the other one of us can't connect with at all. And but I find inter- that quite interesting. Really. Yeah, it is interesting. But I'll, I will say, and I, I was thinking of mentioning it in my original comments, is um, I've never known a band that has had I've been able to persuade less people to be into mm. than this one. I, you know, I, I really tried so many people to, tr- to see what I see in this band, and, and I find it very difficult to to get that message across somehow or it doesn't connect with a lot of people so I'm not surprised I'm not that surprised that you went into it that's well, fine I'm that's no problem sorry to be a disappointment but no no that's no problem um, I, I want us to be able to talk about it openly so that's fine but I, I, I just think I just wish I knew a better way of articulating why the energy and the, the kind of exuberance of this band is, is fun to me but, I think yeah. maybe a big part of that for you Nick comes from the fact that you saw them in such an amazing circumstance the first time like you but it, the gig was just them, a gig I mean it, live yeah but if and, if, if, if and they yeah. really grabbed you so maybe that's a big part of where your connection comes from and maybe they're one of those bands that to see live first is sure is, but they did grab me that's what I mean I mean in yeah. a sense if, if they weren't if they didn't have anything uh, then they wouldn't have grabbed oh, me no no yeah, I'm not, I've I seen a hell of a lot of support slots I don't think they don't have anything at all I didn't not like them yeah I just didn't Feel like a deep emotional connection. connection. Yeah, do, yeah, yeah. I didn't feel myself wanting to go back to it, but I imagine seeing a performance like that and the one you talked about at Reading, mm. that can change your mind about a band. Oh yeah, just by yeah, yeah. And I, definitely, there's definitely something there. But I think sure. maybe another band, a bit like Sebado, when you when you introduce us to them, is something that I feel like if I'd have got in at the start, yeah, and maybe back then when my taste of music was a little bit different, I would have got into them. Mm. But at the minute, I, I haven't been able to as of yet. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I uh, Sebado is. I would agree with uh, with Fran on on the my uh, set like connection to Sebado, and and also Dinosaur Junior, where I can like get into it, but I'm always kind of wondering what it must have been like to be listening to them early in my life or earlier in my life, and then also earlier in their lives. Um, and uh, feeling like some kind of nostalgia for something like I never experienced. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, with Quasi, I've um, been drawn to them, I think, consistently after you know the initial kind of lead-up period because of the I, the drums. I think for me were like really infectious, but 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 weird, and yeah. um, and and so I the the melody of the of the drum beats on top of that sarcastic sarcastic voice was just gold <laughs> <laughs> i think and i think you know if we were to compare it to like bloody Val- my bloody valentine and how low in the mix the uh, voices this one is like so uh, his voice is so uh up front and obvious and I love that about it, you know. Uh, it really clear. Everything is so clearly enunciated, and, you know. And, and I, that accessibility, uh, maybe. Yeah, so we can tell all these very cynical stories about, um, you know, being tied to a desk, uh, you know, on a nine to five, and you know, kind of wandering the streets, bored. And I mean, all of that um, sounds like I should love it, doesn't it? Really cynical moment <laughs> about being tied to. I should love that. But right. Well, keep going then. Maybe you never I need know. to you keep never going know. with it. So okay, so. Um, that's great. So I, I figure that's the lot for the these six. Um, I wanted to. I don't know if you have any honorary mentions. Now we didn't get to talk before we started recording about this, but um, I had an honorary mention this week of uh, this month of uh, an album by uh, a side project of a member of Local Natives, um, which is the album's called uh, Jaws of Love. Tasha, the album. Sorry, the, the band's called Jaws of Love. The album's called Tasha sits close to the piano. Um, really beautiful um, piano ballads. Um, are not uh, are the same quality as the, as the actual local natives, the full band, but but certainly worth checking out. So, uh, did either of you have anything you want to mention as a as an honorary one? I have one. Um, a singer called Nadine Shaw. Um, this album is Holiday Destination. It's her third album. Um, she's uh, she's from Newcastle. Um, she's she's kind of um, a second generation immigrant and she sings a lot about immigration and that kind of thing but also she's just a lot of fun she's quite quite raucous there's a few um songs about getting pissed but then there's songs about how 
there's a fascist control in the White House. Um, there's a brilliant <laughs> song there? on wow. there called 2016, News. which is all about... She turned 30 in 2016, and the world turned to shit in 2016, and she does a beautiful song about that. Uh, it's a great nice. album. All three of her albums are very good, but she's, I think she's, uh, she's stepped it up with this one. Nice. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to know on that, or do you want to uh, what we do next I, month? Uh, can I offer a, a older um, album? Yeah. Um, something I've been listening to recently, um, which is the, the soundtrack to Jesus Christ Superstar. Do you mean uh, from Genius' album? Is that, is that the same oh. thing? Oh, Nope, uh, it's a Jesus Christ Superstar, oh. Andrew Lloyd Webber, and Tim Rice. Uh, it's a Broadway show. I want to say no, you can't offer that. Um, <laughs> uh, for a moment, the brilliance of this musical, and uh, would love to, an opportunity for everyone to uh, listen to it and to really test the limits of the Picky Bastards podcast. Well, you're uh, welcome to choose it as your uh, classic. Why I love your classic, or you know, your introduction. Because I think we've all heard at least you can't has it the classic. Because surely at least we've all heard Jesus Christ Superstar. I don't think I have. You've never heard the song Jesus Christ. I don't Superstar. think so. No. Uh, I'm an atheist. Do you not what can want I to say? sell it at Christmas? No, I'm an atheist. What can I say? <laughs> um, feel free to choose it as your uh, your introduction if you want, and I'll just decide not to listen to that playlist this, <laughs> that month. Or or maybe I'll do Hamilton, which is which is superior. But, you know, this, this, this soundtrack I've been listening to, Bashak, my wife just brought it up randomly one day and I started listening to it and again after a while. And uh, I'd say it's pretty, it's pretty good. Okay. Thank you very much. What did you say about the daughter album earlier? Are you talking about Jesus Christ? Uh, I, I want to Brands cry in right shock. Now. Brands in shock. So uh, next to my next time, we have uh, Fran will be taking over the reins next time. So, uh, Nermal, what are you going with as your two... New albums that you've heard of but not heard. Uh, not quite ready yet. Go ahead and you go first. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm going to do uh, Benjamin Clementine's new album, I Tell a Fly. Uh, Benjamin Clementine, who won the Murphy Prize a couple of years ago. And I'm also doing uh, Death from Above 1979. The album is called Outrage is Now. I mean, I know what Nermal's doing. If, if you don't know Nermal, if, you, if you'd like me to help. Uh, yeah. No, I know I'm, what I'm doing. And... <laughs> In life. Uh, but uh, but why don't you go ahead? So it's uh, Jay Hoos is Common Sense and yes, um, Love in the Fourth Dimension by Big Moon. They are Nermal's two albums. Um, <laughs> Those are my albums. <laughs> Sounds like it. And I will be doing the classic album and the uh, sort of why I love an artist next time. So for the classic album, I've chosen Strange Mercy by Saint Vincent, which uh, is their third album. I'm not going to try and tell you what year it's from. Um, and I will be introducing Nick and Nermal and the rest of you to Skunk and Nancy via a playlist. Nice. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's everything. So uh, everyone can say goodbye, and I'll see you next time. Next time. Yeah.